Welcome to this uh, course in uh, scale homogenization techniques. Um, this is the uh, first lecture of three. Um, I am uh, Ruth Veenhoven. Uh, the other lectures will be given by my colleague Tineke de Jonge. And we are both located in Erasmus University in the Erasmus Happiness Economics Research Organization. Well, this e-course consists of three lectures. Uh, first, the introduction, what you are watching now, and that is an overview. And next, uh, there is detailed explanations of how these techniques work. And uh, together with uh, these techniques, you also get a, a book and software, and you pay for it, whereas this lecture is free. Well, it's an overview of scale homogenization techniques. Um, maybe uh, you want to know, first of all, um, uh, who we are. Uh, we made these techniques and uh, how we uh, got into this uh, uh, subject. Well, and we got into the subject because there was a problem. So I will uh, explain what the problem is, um, the solutions uh, we found, and how you apply these techniques. Uh, uh, we developed these techniques for application in the World Database of Happiness, and I will show you how that works. Well, and after this uh, overview, uh, you may wonder how you can learn more about that, how you can really apply it, and that's where it ends. Well, this is a, a six point, and um, well, a lot to tell about. Um, let's start with the first point, uh, uh, who we are. Well, I'm Ruud Veenhoven, uh, you've already seen me. Uh, uh, this is uh, Tineke de Jonge, um, uh, you will see her in uh, the next uh, two lectures. And the third in our group is uh, Wilm Kalmijn, um, who passed away. Um, Tineke, um, she studied uh, uh, mathematics. Um, uh, she works in well, policy, in the policy of social security. Uh, and next to her job, uh, uh, she developed uh, one of the methods uh, which will be discussed uh, today. And uh, on that basis, uh, she got a PhD. And after the PhD, she still wanted to continue, and um, she edited a, a book in which all these methods to be discussed today are summarized. Well, uh, it is me. Uh, I'm a sociologist by education. I spent most of my uh, career uh, uh, teaching uh, psychology. I specialized in happiness research, and particularly in comparative happiness research, and I founded the World Database of Happiness. And, well, the techniques which we will discuss in this lecture uh, are developed in the context of that World Database of Happiness. And this is Wim Kalmijn. Um, Wim is not a social scientist. He is actually, he was trained as a, a chemical engineer, and uh, most of his life he worked in uh, the chemical industry, um, but specialized on statistics. And after his retirement, well, he joined our group at the university, and he developed one of the techniques uh, 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 which uh, we will show today. And uh, at age um, uh, 76, he uh, did a PhD on this subject. Well, uh, three people, uh, all involved uh, in scale homogenization. How did we get into that matter? Well, it is a spin-off uh, of research on happiness. Um, we do comparative research and we uh, um, gather a lot of findings and we want to compare them uh, and put them in the World Database of Happiness. Well, and if you want to compare, you need techniques for make things comparable. And this World Database of Happiness, and which is uh, uh, available uh, at the web, 
uh, that is a findings archive. It's not a bibliography uh, with publications. It's uh, uh, neither a uh, um, uh, data archive uh, with primary data. Uh, no, it's an archive of findings, of correlations, of means and standard deviations uh, observed in different places and times. And, uh, well, in this world database of happiness, by now, uh, we have some 25,000 such findings. And why do we collect them? Well, we uh, want to do uh, research synthesis. But if you want to do research synthesis, uh, uh, that requires comparability. And that's a problem because, as we will see later, uh, the measures of happiness used are very diverse. Let's go on. Well, and working with the World Database of Happiness, uh, we uh, have developed stepwise over time uh, the different methods to make these measures, uh, these findings more comparable. And in the 1980s, uh, we started with, well, simple methods. Um, and then we discovered that these methods were too simple. Uh, we uh, developed a new method, the scale interval method, uh, which uh, we will see later in this lecture. And ten years later, uh, we uh, developed, uh, well, two more sophisticated um, uh, techniques. And, well, if you see it in books, uh, um, the first book uh, in which the, well, more simple methods we described was um, uh, 1994. Um, then in 2010, uh, the dissertation of uh, Wim Kalmijn. In 2015, uh, uh, the dissertation of Tineke de Jonge. And in uh, last year, Tineke de Jonge uh, gathered this all in an overview book. And this book is actually the basis of uh, um, this course. Well, you see, uh, this um, altogether took some 30 years, and uh, in this course uh, we hope to convince uh, that these 30 years in three hours. Well, we develop technique. Uh, you develop technique for solving a problem. And what exactly is the problem? Well, the problem, eh, if you compare uh, results of uh, surveys, eh, large-scale uh, questionnaire studies, uh, then one of the problems is that you deal with different people. Eh, some uh, living in the US, uh, some in Europe, uh, some in Asia, also different times. And the first studies on happiness uh, were done in the 1950s. That's different. And what's also different is the techniques used. Uh, there are different sampling techniques, but there are also different interview techniques. And the last problem, uh, that is that in these uh, um, uh, big polls, uh, these surveys, um, that well, different questions are used for, for the same thing. And uh, these differences are in the wording of the questions, in the language, and in the response scales used. Well, this, uh, um, the techniques we present in this um, uh, course are about these different questions for the same topic. Uh, we don't solve the problem of different publics, and different uh, uh, techniques of data gathering. No, we focus on what to do with the difference in the existing data that are in the wording of the question, in the language of the question, in, and in its translations, and in the response scales used. Let me illustrate these problems uh, on the case of happiness research. Um, happiness, uh, we define that as 
the subjective enjoyment of one's life as a whole. Well, that's something that people have on their mind, and because they have it on their mind, you can ask them directly, and actually you can uh, ask them uh, that in a single question. I will now show you some of these single questions on happiness, and you will see that there are different ways to um, question people about the same. Well, here you have an example, a commonly used question um, which reads, taking all together, how happy would you say you are? A definition of happiness. Well, and then people can say that they are very happy, fairly happy, or not too happy. Simple. But you can also phrase the question in another way. You can ask, well, generally speaking, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? And very satisfied, satisfied, neither satisfied nor dissatisfied, dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. Same concept, different questions. And here is still another variant. Are you a happy person? Well, and on this question the respondent can choose between strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree or strongly disagree. And, well, <laughs> it's also possible to phrase the lead a bit different. Here it is, how satisfied are you with the life you lead? Well, and then you can be very satisfied, fairly satisfied, not very satisfied or not at all satisfied. And still another variant is that there are not such verbal response options, but that people respond on a numerical scale. And so in this case the question is, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? And then um, if you're, ha, I see I do it wrongly, um, if you're dissatisfied you say one, and if you're very satisfied you say ten. Well, what are the differences in these examples I just showed you? Well, one difference is in the keyword used. Eh? Happiness, uh, satisfaction, uh, a happy person. Well, and I showed them all in English, but of course these questions are also used in other languages, in French, Chinese, Dutch, and it's also a problem comparing these. And you also saw a difference in the rating scale. And the first uh, examples were verbal uh, response options, and, uh, but they differed in steps. And uh, there was also a numerical, and the last one, um, and actually there was a range of uh, 11 steps. Now the problem is, that if you want to compare, if for instance you want to know whether people in one country are happier uh, than in another, then you should have exactly the same question. And the keyword should be the same, and should be happiness or life satisfaction. And yeah, actually, um, comparing people uh, in Spanish and in English, no, the best is that people use the same mother language. And also uh, the answers uh, should be uh, rated on the same scale, otherwise you cannot compare. Well, these are the problems. Let's now look at the solutions. Um, well, it's difficult in the case of keywords, um, but the problem eh, of different keywords, and one uh, question using happiness, the other using life satisfaction, uh, uh, well, the difference between the balance of these words uh, we can get at if in a country the same question in the same year is used 
with different words. And the best would be if it was in the same survey. And uh, that um, is actually the reference distribution method, which will uh, be discussed later in this lecture. The problem of language, well, that can be solved if we um, ask people in different languages uh, what the intensity, the happiness intensity is of particular words. Uh, for instance, uh, how happy is very happy. And that uh, is part of the um, a happiness scale interval study, which I will show. And the last problem, actually the easiest, is the problem of the response scales. If you want to compare uh, the happiness in, say, the US and in the Netherlands, um, and one question is expressed on scale, numerical scale from zero to 10, and in the other country, on a verbal scale, from uh, very happy to uh, not happy, well, then you have to bring that on the same scale. And that's where we start. Eh? We start with the easiest problem. And um, the trick is then to transform um, uh, ratings uh, made by respondents uh, on, 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 a, on a response scale to bring the to the same uh, um, numerical scale and because 0 to 10 is the most commonly used and the best understood, uh, we try to transform all these responses to that same numerical scale of 0 to 10. And we do that with numerical response scales made on a shorter numerical scale, but the biggest problem is to transform uh, responses made on a verbal response scale to this same numerical scale from 0 to 10. Well, in the case of uh, numerical scales that uh, range between 7 and 11, well, the practice learns that you can easily stretch that. Um, but you can stretch it only if the extremes of the scale are the same. Uh, is, um, for instance, uh, the one numerical scale is rated satisfied, dissatisfied, uh, but the other extremely satisfied, extremely dissatisfied, um, then uh, a numerical uh, um, a linear stretch uh, will not work, and then the reference distribution method must be used. Now, the transformation, the more difficult transformation from verbal to a numerical scale. And there are actually um, several methods to do that. Uh, well, the most simple, I would say the uh, primitive method, is uh, that you, uh, well, take the rank number of the response options, and uh, there's unhappy is one, uh, fairly happy is two, and very happy is three, and you take the average and you stretch. Another approach is that you give the response options a value. And for instance, that you say, well, uh, uh, very happy is eight. And on the basis uh, of these uh, uh, fixed values, uh, these values you attribute to a verbal response option, you can also compute an average and you can stretch that average to um, zero to ten. Um, a more sophisticated method is that you estimate um, what, you don't estimate yourself uh, what 
eh, how happy, very happy is, but you ask native speakers to do that, and you ask a lot of them, and you take the average. And still another uh, approach is the reference distribution method, already mentioned several times, but not yet explained. Well, um, this is, well, say, uh, the primitive method, the method of uh, uh, fixed values that is known as the Thurston method. Actually, it was already uh, um, used in the 1920s. The method using the judgments of native speakers is the scale interval method, which I will discuss in some more detail later. And if, if you use an observed distribution, that is the reference distribution method, which will also be discussed in more detail. Let's go to the, well, the most primitive rank and stretch method. Well, um, what is the value of a response option? Well, that is the number in the row, and if the row goes from unhappy to happy, and there are three options, then very happy is three. And then you compute the mean, and then you stretch. Let's see how that works. And here we have verbal response options, very happy, pretty happy, not too happy. Well, the rank is three, and that is the most. Uh, uh, happy to one. Here we have the frequencies. Well, and if you combine the frequencies and, and the, the rank value, um, uh, then you get a mean of uh, uh, 2.3. Um, and if you stretch that, and which means that you multiply it by 3.33, uh, then you get a mean of 6.5, and the standard deviations can be computed in the same way. Well, this easy, but uh, this method has serious limitations. And first of all, you assume equidistance. Hey, you assume that the distance between uh, very happy and pretty happy is the same as between pretty happy and not too happy. Well, and that will not always be the case. And another assumption, especially if you use this method in comparison across nations, uh, uh, you assume that very happy is the same as, for instance, in French, très heureux, or in Spanish, muy feliz, or in German, sehr glücklich. And that can, of course, be and differences in the balance of words in different languages. And yes, these limitations are true, and because if you uh, look at the correspondence uh, between um, average scores of happiness uh, transformed in this way and compare with observations um, in the same population um, made on a numerical scale, uh, you see a pretty poor fit. So this is not the way to go. And um, what would be a better alternative? Well, an alternative, and that is the fixed values approach, is that you uh, uh, ask, uh, well, experts to estimate what is actually very happy on a scale of uh, ranging uh, between 0 and 10. Well, we did that in our team, and, uh, well, uh, on, on average, we uh, thought that very happy equals about 9.3, pretty happy about uh, 6.5, and not too happy 4.1. Well, and if you compute a mean and standard deviation using these fixed values, uh, then you see that there is a difference uh, with the stretch method I showed earlier. Yes, and this is another approach, but also limitations, because, well, 
the experts, you know, the people in our team, um, yeah, what we think uh, it, that very happy means may not be the same valence as what the respondents have in mind. And the language problem is still not solved. Uh, um, if you give very happy, uh, if you decide that is eight in, uh, in English, uh, but then it would also be in French. And even worse, in this approach uh, that you say very happy is, say, uh, uh, 9.3, um, then you don't take into account that the uh, option very happy can figure in different um, contexts. And for instance, here, here we have that question, very happy, pretty happy, not too happy, in three options, but here, very happy, happy, not too happy, unhappy, and in this, in the context hey, of this four-step scale, very happy probably means more happiness than in this three-step scale. Well, how can we uh, um, solve that problem? Uh, that problem is solved by uh, the scale interval method. Actually, the first serious uh, innovation uh, we made on this track. And in this scale interval method, uh, the value of response options is rated in the context of the total scale and in the language. And these ratings are made by native speakers. And for this purpose, we use an online scale interval recorder. Here we see the scale interval recorder. Hey, you are looking now on a, on a computer screen, and this uh, can be assessed online. And here you see the question. And the question is, taking all together, uh, how would you say things are these days? Would you say you are very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? Well, these response options eh, of very happy, pretty happy, and not too happy are presented here on this scale. And this scale goes from the best possible life to the worst possible life. And the judge can move these bars. And by moving these bars, uh, he can indicate eh, which interval fits very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy. And we see that on the next slide. And so um, if you move the bar, and this, this moves with the bar, and it's always in the center. And here you see that uh, this judge uh, thinks that, well, uh, very happy in English um, corresponds with the interval uh, between 10 and 8. Pretty happy uh, between uh, um, 8 and 5.5, and not so happy uh, with the rest. Well, and this is of course not done by uh, one judge, um, but by several, and uh, typically for uh, uh, one question in a particular language, we use 200 uh, judges, 200 native speaking judges. Well, and if you apply that, and in uh, 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 this case, hey, this, uh, the very happy is rated 8.7 on average, fairly happy uh, uh, 5.3, and not so happy uh, uh, the mid interval is uh, uh, 1.8. And if you use these contextual values in English, uh, then we get a mean of uh, uh, 6.3, which is actually closer eh, to the primitive method eh, than to the fixed value method. And uh, you can do that in uh, different languages. Eh? This is the example I just showed in English, uh, but we have also done it in uh, Spanish. And then you see that 
and the equivalent of very happy in Spanish, muy feliz, is actually rated higher. Um, uh, they're uh, fairly happy, bastante feliz, is similarly, uh, but not too happy, no muy feliz, is rated lower. And, uh, well, if we then uh, compute a contextual value in Spanish, uh, we get uh, 6.4, which is actually pretty close uh, to um, uh, the value in English. This is a good method. Uh, it's um, uh, a great advance, but there are limitations. And one limitation is obviously uh, uh, that if you apply this method, uh, you have to well test eh, all survey questions on your topic, in this case happiness, in all languages. Well, there are many languages, um, but there are also uh, many uh, questions on happiness. So this requires quite an investment. And another limitation is that if you ask judges, well, uh, judges can help you to understand the balance of the words in their language, but judges, judges also make uh, mistakes, and so this is an additional source of error. And if we check uh, how well these um, um, transformed means correspond uh, with the means observed in the same year on a direct question, then, well, we see a pretty good fit, but certainly not a perfect fit. So we, um, you, you can see that here. Um, it, it, this is a question uh, uh, used in the World Value Survey. Um, uh, well, uh, how happy would you say you are? Very happy, pretty happy. And if we apply uh, this scale interval method, um, in Dutch, uh, uh, then we uh, get a mean of uh, uh, 706. If we see what the answer is on the same question, huh, but now rated huh, on a numerical uh, scale in the European Social Survey, well, we see a difference. And so, um, it's not the same. And that's why we, uh, uh, we're looking for improvements of this method. And one improvement is the um, continuous distribution variant. What is the continuous distribution? Well, this picture may help to see that. And Non-continuous is, well, uh, there's um, very unhappy, uh, not too happy, um, uh, in between, uh, very happy. And if you uh, ask a question and provide, um, in this case, um, the respondent uh, uh, six uh, answer options, yeah, then you assume that there are uh, six kinds of uh, levels of happiness in the country. But of course, there is actually uh, a continuous distribution. And um, uh, one way to estimate that continuous distribution is to plot uh, um, uh, this in a cumulative uh, frequency distribution. And then, for instance, you see that we have actually an outlier here. And we can then uh, estimate what the mean is if we use that continuous eh, distribution that actually uh, exists in the um, uh, population and that is imperfectly uh, represented uh, by uh, these um, uh, six options. Well, and um, if you do that, and, and we take here an, an example, and you take the traditional uh, uh, mid-interval uh, uh, values, well, then, in this case, um, uh, we get on an average of uh, uh, 7.19, uh, and if we apply the continuous distribution, there is a slight difference, 
but it's not impressive. Still, this value is probably more realistic than this one. And so the advantage is, well, we have a better fit, but the limitation is that um, there is only a small change and the difference uh, with ratings made uh, um, by the same population uh, on um, a numerical 0 to 10 scale, that difference still remains. So that made us look for still another method. And that method is the reference distribution method. And, well, this method um, uh, works that you compare, actually, uh, different questions um, uh, used in the same year and the same population. And that you say, well, one is the reference distribution. Uh, for instance, you have used uh, the question, um, uh, taking all together, uh, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole? Please rate on a scale from zero to ten. Okay, that is your reference, and from that reference, eh, we, um, using that reference, we estimate what the, th eh, the, the meaning is of the response options of a verbal scale. And then we use again this eh, cumulative distribution eh, of a question eh, on a numerical scale, and then if we have a similar question rated on another scale in the same country, we have that here, and we also present the distribution eh, from uh, eh, extraordinarily satisfied, very satisfied, uh, satisfied, fairly satisfied, and not very dissatisfied. And here you can now estimate from not very satisfied, hey, that would actually, that would be 4.5. So using this, uh, uh, this distribution as the reference, you could say that not very satisfied uh, corresponds with the range between 0 and uh, 4.5. And the fairly satisfied corresponds with the um, uh, range at uh, the interval uh, between 4.5 and 5.5. And likewise, uh, um, satisfied uh, um, apparently is between 5.5 and, say, 7.7. Uh, 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 and working in this way, uh, we can estimate the boundaries and see that the meaning extraordinarily satisfied is between the boundaries 10 and 9. Well, um, here's an example of an application. Uh, here is the response on a 1 to 10 uh, um, uh, question on happiness in the World Value Survey. And in 2006, and in 2006, um, Statistic Netherlands also asked a question um, where people could choose between uh, not very satisfied, fairly satisfied, satisfied, very satisfied, and extraordinarily satisfied. Well, if we use that question eh, and press it in the distribution of this one in the same year, uh, then we can derive the following boundaries. And if we apply these boundaries on the observed frequencies in the next year, then we get an average of 7.7, 7.7, and in uh, 2009 uh, um, of 10%. Uh, and here you have 
the means, and if you uh, look at the means, uh, uh, um, you see, well, these means are, of course, the same, eh, because uh, this was the reference, and this, eh, the, the boundaries were made in such a way that the same mean was observed, and if we apply these boundaries um, to later uh, studies using this same uh, verbal question, you first get an average of uh, 719, um, uh, 7, uh, uh, 27, and in the end, uh, 734. Uh, well, this is a step forward, but uh, still uh, there's an obvious uh, limitation, is that you need uh, a question, uh, two questions made in the same year, uh, and preferably in the same survey. Uh, um, otherwise, you get um, uh, differences in measurement. And this method works only from um, uh, uh, verbal scales um, from three uh, options, not for, for two. And the difference in wording in the lead question, and some say, how satisfied are you with the life you lead? or to say how satisfied are you with your life as a whole, that these differences are not taken into account in this method. And this works only for single questions. And well, in research, often questions, um, uh, questionnaires are used, eh? uh, uh, so-called scales. Okay, so much um, uh, for the techniques. How can we use them? First of all, you can use them to uh, compare across different language nations. And for instance, compare uh, the happiness of the Americans and the French. Um, but you can also uh, compare over time within nations. And did the French actually get happier uh, uh, over the years? And the method can also be used for the selection of survey questions. And not all questions are equally good, and this method helps. Let's start with the uh, comparing across languages. Actually, and that's where we begun with the World Database of Happiness, uh, because we want to know uh, which countries are happier than other countries. And what we can do, um, especially uh, with the scale interval method, is eliminate the so-called semantic bias, and that happy in English may be different than heureux in French, feliz in Spanish, or glücklich in German. And thereby we reduce cultural measurement bias. And we reduce the semantic element in that cultural measurement bias. Of course, there's more bias, and there's also bias in response styles. Well, let me show an example. Um, uh, one of the topics in happiness research is that Latin Americans um, are uh, happier than you would expect. Um, and um, uh, especially uh, Mexicans are happier than North Americans. Well, uh, that is surprising. And one of the explanations is that the Spanish language is more uh, positive when it comes to happiness uh, than English, so that this is actually a measurement issue and doesn't mean that life is better uh, in Mexico than it is in uh, uh, the US. Well, here we uh, uh, applied the scale interval method uh, on the same question. Uh, is, um, the question which the options uh, very happy, fairly happy, uh, not very happy, and not at all happy. And, um, well, you see the percentages uh, 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 differ. If we look at the mid-interval values, uh, which were obtained uh, by having judges uh, um, in English and in Spanish rate, then you see that there is little difference uh, between uh, very happy in Spanish and in English and neither uh, fairly happy. 
there is some difference in not very happy, which is rated a bit higher in Spanish than in English, and similarly for not at all happy. But these differences are pretty small. If we look at the uncorrected averages, well, then in Spain, it's 3.12. Uh, um, uh, uh, in the US, it's a bit higher, and the difference is 3.3%. If we apply the scale interval method, in which we remove uh, the, uh, uh, the bias and uh, the language bias, the semantic bias, uh, then we get here an average of, um, say, 6.69, and here uh, 6.08, and the uh, difference is, well, almost uh, the same. So this means um, that language is not the point. Uh, the, the, the difference uh, between 3.3 .3 and 3.7 is uh, pretty marginal. Uh, so when eh, Spanish-speaking Mexicans eh, rate their happiness higher than uh, English-speaking Americans, uh, the problem is not in the language, eh, it, but is in something else, and that could be the livability of the society. These techniques can also be used um, for comparing over time within a nation. Eh, did the Americans get any happier eh, since the first measurement in uh, 1945. Well, to make a long story short, eh, you can um, use the traditional rank method. And uh, uh, here we have um, uh, the case of Japan. Well, that remains pretty flat. Um, you can use the fixed value method. Well. And if you see that here, you see that in Japan, they changed the wording of the questions. And that drastically changed the picture. If you use the scale interval method, and in that method you neutralize uh, the, uh, the questions um, that, uh, used, and then you see a more, um, well, a, a similar pattern over time, but not uh, this break, and actually, if you use the uh, reference distribution method, um, you you get a higher average, um, but the same pattern uh, over time. A last application is that you can use these methods uh, and um, to select survey questions, and um, well, what would be a good question on happiness. Well, if you have a verbal question, um, uh, then uh, you would like uh, that the, uh, the distance uh, between the options is, um, well, the same, or at least close to the same. And you would also like that uh, respondents interpret the response options in the same way. And that becomes visible in the standard deviations of the ratings they make. Well, here we have uh, an example of uh, two variants of a common question. One is very happy, pretty happy, and not too happy, and the other is very happy, fairly happy, and not too happy. Yeah, um, which is the best? Well, let's uh, look at the distance. And in this case, hey, the distance between very and pretty happy is um, uh, 2.5, and here it is uh, 3.7. And if we take the distance between pretty and not to, um, in this case, uh, it's 3.1, and here it's 3.7. And which is the most equidistant? Well, uh, um, that is um, uh, this question, 
Hey, the, these distances are about the same, whereas here is a bigger difference. And um, if we uh, look at the standard deviations, uh, we uh, can see that the term pretty gives um, a bigger standard deviation than the term fairly. Um, so taken all together, this is the better question. Well, and how do we use these techniques in the World Database of Happiness? Well, as I told you, the World Database of Happiness is a findings archive. And we first uh, harvest the literature on subjective well-being, and then we select the studies that report on uh, happiness as how much you like your life as a whole. And uh, then we uh, take out the findings, uh, first distributional findings, how happy people are in particular uh, times and places, and next correlational findings on the things that go together with happiness. And these distributional findings, uh, we also gather them in nations because we want to know in what kind of nation people live happiest. Well, and then here you see a list of nations ordered alphabetically. And uh, if I select Japan, and then you get here uh, information on Japan, how happy they are on average. Well, on numerical scale from 0 to 10, uh, the average in Japan is uh, uh, 6.4. Um, that is lower than the highest ever observed in Costa Rica, but much better than the lowest ever observed of 2.5 in Tanzania. And here you see the observations in Japan over time. And this is not all the same question, uh, but we have completed uh, this uh, time series and by transforming um, uh, uh, several questions. And this gives us, well, the row. And then you see that happiness has well, remained almost at the same level, even though there has been a slight rise. And, well, we can also transform the available data of all nations in the world, and uh, that uh, uh, produces um, uh, this uh, uh, map of happiness, a uh, world map of happiness. And on this map, the darker the green, the happier the people. And here you have the case uh, I discussed before. Eh? Mexicans eh, are on average happier uh, uh, than uh, Americans. And Mexican happiness is not, uh, well, uh, exceptional eh? because happiness in Latin America is actually higher than you would expect when you read the newspapers. Well, these are the techniques. Uh, how can you apply them? Uh, suggestion one, read our book. Um, suggestion two, um, follow the next modules. And so in, in this lecture, I have given you an overview of how these techniques work. Yes, but the other question is how to use them in practice, eh? how to run a scale interval method, eh? how to transform the data. And uh, the same is for the reference distribution method are, well, pretty uh, uh, difficult techniques and you need also uh, software tools to apply them. Well, this is uh, if you want to do it yourself. If you say it's too difficult, um, well, then you can hire us for help. Uh, we can give an in-service uh, training or um, we can help you analyze your data. And especially if you have broken time series or you want to compare across uh, different groups, uh, that might be helpful. About the book, well, this is it, and here is how you can order it. 
And this book is included if you order the next lecture. And these next lectures, paid lectures, uh, one will be about the scale interval methods in particular, and the other about the reference distribution method. And to give you an overview of the contents, uh, and Tineke, uh, well, she will start with uh, uh, an overview, um, but then go into the detail of uh, how do you use that uh, uh, method, how do you get uh, uh, judges, how uh, do you process uh, the data, and how do you apply them, and in particular, um, how do you apply the continuum uh, variant. Well, and that is 150 euro inclusive the ebook uh, and uh, the software. And you can order this at the Secretariat of uh, Erasmus Happiness Economics. And uh, a third lecture is on the reference distribution method. Uh, again, uh, start with uh, a rehearsal of the, uh, um, the problem and the solutions, and then detail about uh, uh, how that works and how you make the comparison and how you select a reference distribution and um, how you uh, apply the values obtained in that. Well, and you can also hire us uh, 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 for help uh, and our uh, rate is 150 uh, an hour. Well, I hope uh, this works and uh, that uh, I've broadened uh, your scope on scale homogenization techniques. Thanks for the attention.